<clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for the webinar series entitled Civic Engagement and Climate Change Policies. Again, we thank you for joining us for this topic. On behalf of SHLI and Daniel Dawes, we hold this topic with high regard. It's often overlooked in our society and rarely connected to health outcomes within this country, especially when we're talking about civic engagement. Daniel Dawes is not able to join us today, but he sends his regards and well wishes on this topic. But on behalf of SHLI, we believe that many individuals fail to recognize or even take for granted the impact civic engagement has on our health well-being and life expectancy. A lack of civic engagement equates to a lack of voice, which means no resolution. A lack of civic engagement results in perpetuating the same results. Americans must understand that by remaining apathetic, we are contributing to the long-term survival of these inequities, which are the very thing contributing to the deterioration of our health and beyond, ultimately, the health of this country. When it comes to being, the leading, to being the leading transformative force for health equity, the Satcher Health Leadership Institute recognizes the importance of collaboration. And we, fuse, we uh, fuse these energies with other entities, acknowledging the unequal burden of environmentally attributed negative health outcomes and social outcomes in our vulnerable populations is key. However, we must continue to address the upstream factors that can really curtail these negative impacts from occurring in the historically marginalized population of this country. And luckily and happily today, we have someone who's going to address this topic, Ms. Hillary Holly, who is the organizing director of Fair Fight Action, an organization who is no stranger to fighting these upstream factors. Miss Hillary Holly, Holly was born in Augusta, Georgia and raised in Lawrenceville, Georgia. She moved to Atlanta to attend Georgia State University where she became active in local criminal justice reform movements. After graduating from college, Hillary began applying to law school while she taught middle school writing where she incorporated current social justice issues within Atlanta and the state. Hillary left teaching to work for the 2018 coordinated campaign and with the Abrams for Governor campaign communications and digital team to ensure that Georgia's activist and movement family was represented and involved in Georgia's historic campaign. After the campaign ended, Hillary remained working for Stacey Abrams through her new voting rights organization, Fair Fight Action, specifically to combat voter suppression in her home state so that the will and the voice of its constituency would not go unheard. Hillary is currently the director of organizing for Fair Fight Action, where she manages all grassroots volunteers, partnerships with allied organizations, and building a grassroots and grass tops network to fight for voting rights and government accountability. On behalf of SHLI, please join me in welcoming Hillary with a huge warm welcome. We are glad to have you here with us today, Hillary. But we first like to start off, can you tell us a little bit about Fair Fight its initiatives and the work your organization is doing with the environmental health equity and climate and within the uh, climate justice space as it relates to the vulnerable populations you serve. Yes, absolutely. Well, first I wanna say thank you so much for having me. We at Fair Fight Action absolutely love school, uh, Morehouse School of Medicine and everything you do for our community. Um, so at Fair Fight Action, we believe that so many issues that impact um, black and brown communities specifically um, are, are linked together. And that is linked in voting rights, climate, the climate crisis and environmental justice. Um, and so what we do is we try to fight for voting rights so all eligible voters can have a voice in the issues they care about. And we know that the climate crisis is one of the top issues that people are um, concerned about across the country, especially with our younger generation. And so we wanna make sure that their voices are heard so they can have an elected government that truly represents their values. And so that's one of the ways that we 
really like to stay informed in supporting our, um, our environmental justice um, um, partners across the country and across the state, um, because without the right to vote, all issues are on the table. I believe you're muted. Dr. Thank Jennifer. you. Can you tell us about any um, particular initiatives that you might know of that, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. Yep. So basically what we all know is after Georgia, um, especially our voters of color from around the entire state, they showed up several times in 2020, right? We showed up for the primary where COVID was just at the very beginning and people didn't know how democracy was gonna survive, but voters showed out anyways. They then showed up again in November um, and then showed up again <laughs> in January. Yes. Um, and we know because of Georgia, um, um, we made a true impact in the current structure of our government. And ooh, I'm so sorry, y'all. And who is representing our government? Exactly. And so one thing that we continue to do is look at what, where voter suppression a lot of times um, happens most in the communities who are most vulnerable mm -hmm. for many of the crises that we see happening. So for example, we talk a lot about environmental justice. We know that voter suppression a lot of times y'all will start on the rural, in the rural communities in rural Georgia um, in the vulnerable communities that are left behind. These sometimes are the same exact communities where we see um, um, we see pollution, highest pollution rates in communities of color due to um, lack of infrastructure. We actually see sometimes where, um, you know, um, the coal ash situation in middle Georgia. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of times they do not have the electoral power to make true justice for the climate crises that they are seeing. And so, and another thing that we are, so we work to expand um, voting rights to then help uplift electoral justice, to elect people who will care about the communities who come from the communities and represent them, um, especially demographically. But then we also make sure to then help partner with our friends who are in the battles um, after elections, right? And so looking at climate crisis, but and looking at Medicaid expansion, because another thing we know is that when we see a climate crisis happening, it also increases healthcare demands. And we know very well in the state of Georgia that healthcare, um, we also have a healthcare crisis. We have hospitals closing down across the state, especially in our rural communities. We see the state government making budget cuts to our public health departments in our counties, all during a global pandemic. And a lot of times the reason why some of the elected officials feel as if they can they can get away with this and they can choose who to pay attention to and who not pay attention to is because we a lot of times do not have a representative government due to voter suppression and a lot of other systemic um, um, you know, um, malpractices we see across the country, specifically here in the South. And so there are times where um, through RC4 and saying nonpartisan, um, I will work with uh, Morehouse School of Medicine or Daniel Dawes to see how can we help get communities of color vaccinated? How can we, if, if there is a, um, a crisis happening community where healthcare, um, you know, we, um, that we need to make political calls or we need to do community outreach in any way to better take care of our community, we are always offering a helping hand. And it's actually really appropriate um, that we're, I'm here this morning is Fair Fight um, led by Stacey Abrams. We actually got to announce that we contributed nearly $1.5 million to, a, um, to an organization called RIP Medical Debt, where we are forgiving and paying for over 60,000 Georgians um, to relieve all their medical debt. And we're not just doing that in Georgia, but we did it in Arizona, Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. Um, and one of the reasons why we did this is because we know that medical debt um, oftentimes is created in these communities because they don't have 
access to healthcare. Their healthcare can be more expensive. Um, and sometimes they require more healthcare because they are unhealthy due to their environmental situation. Exactly. Right. So this is all connected. Mm -hmm. And that's why at Fair Fight Action, I'm just really thrilled to have a leader such as Stacy, our CEO, Lauren Goldwart, or Girl Wargo, and our friends at Morehouse College, where we can really get um, creative with trying to um, with trying to really um, impact and look at um, what is needed in this moment in a very holistic sense, not just with voting rights, but making sure that we are rooted in taking care of our community and rooted in taking care of the people. Um, so again, thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And oh, I guess before I turn it over, I, I, I know that people want to know the state of democracy. So I'll, yes. I'll hit on that really quickly. Too. Thank you. <laughs> so we all, because Georgia showed up and showed out in 2020, um, we saw some of the most historical Jim Crow 2.0 practices that we have seen since Reconstruction era. Um, in Georgia, in the South, we were the leaders. Um, we saw them pass um, just terrifying um, anti-voting legislation that would make it harder for not just voters of color to vote y'all, but voters with disabilities, um, working class voters, um, rural voters. It, they, they were so egregious with their voter suppression that everyone got impacted. And what then happened is Georgia then became the model and we saw anti-voting rights legislation spread across the country in over 43 states. Mm -hmm. Over 500 anti-voting bills have been filed in state legislatures this year alone. But because of Georgia, we now are able to go to an administration and be able to go to a Congress who is now more amenable to hearing um, what do we do to fight democracy. And so working with Senator um, Warnock and working with Senator Ossoff, we have been advocating to pass the Freedom to Vote Act and advocating to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And these are both two critical bills um, that will give, it will not solve all of the voter suppression issues, but it will be a way to mitigate voter suppression in the states, um, especially states that have a historical um, background of voter suppression, but it will also be a tool uh, for poll workers and um, local election administrations to use who actually want to expand access to the ballot, but sometimes the states um, will not allow them to <laughs> because yes. of historical racism. And so I know right now Congress is looking a little bit stalled, right? We have seen failed votes due to uh, procedural rules such as the filibuster, but I want everyone here to know that we are not giving up. We still have hope. Um, Leader Chuck Schumer um, is working with us and um, Senator Warnock every single day to try to get something passed so we can really restore the Senate and make sure that we protect democracy because democracy is not a partisan issue. As I said before, the, the attack on democracy is such a crisis that everyone is impacted. And, and, as, and going back to the theme of today, we have to have a representative government if we truly want to be able to equitably combat the, Christ, the climate crisis that we are facing in this country and across the world. And so I really see our work at Fair Fight Action is a tool to help people like you all um, have advocates um, backing you up and taking your advice and not just taking your advice, but putting it into actual application and seeing pol good policy applied. Um, and so that's, so I just want everyone, let's not give up hope. Um, when we fight, we win. Georgia has shown it before. And when we, fight and mitigate voter suppression, it gives us the chance to help alleviate and really start combating climate change in a true and impactful way. Well, yes, yes to all of what you said, Hillary. Just especially when you talk about uh, the tool of what, what it is and what Fair Fight is doing, you guys are are creating, to me, you creating Georgia is, is a model, right? As you said, other um, places, whether it be for the positive or for a negative in terms of the model legislation that's being formed against or for, and uh, in terms of applying and informing other policies 
other platforms that are are created. And you're working with, of course, the senators in Georgia, which we hope to have in some of our next series. And in terms of democracy and civic engagement is nonpartisan, right? We know that it is a fair fight, not giving up hope, but being optimistic. And we thank Stacey Abrams, Fair Fight, and you, Hillary. Thank you so much. And uh, if there are any questions, please uh, place them in the chat and we will uh, definitely filter them to Ms. Holly and um, we'll wait for a few minutes to see if there are any questions. But if not, if I know you have to go and hopefully kind of facilitate some additional actions. And uh, if we don't have any questions, we thank you again, Ms. Holly, and look forward to hearing and seeing you in the future. Thank you for fighting with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So we'll next proceed on to uh, our panelists, right? And I'm going to transition this part of the webinar over to Sarah Houston. Sarah Houston is the lead public health attorney for the state of Nebraska and serves as the policy advisor for the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. She holds a Juris Doctor from the University of Nebraska College of Law and is trained as a critical care flight paramedic. As a former professor, Dr. Houston's research interests involve the intersection of healthcare, ethics, and law, as well as transdisciplinary collaboration in education. Through her work, she aims to enhance the use of law as a tool in the effort to study and achieve health equity. Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Sandover. So addressing climate change, we know, is a complex process both in our efforts to reduce climate change, as well as our efforts to prepare for the inevitable impact of climate change. And it's affected by countless factors, social, political, legal, economic, behavioral, and psychological. While many have offered that our response to climate change must be widespread and involve truly every person at every layer of government, increasing evidence suggests cities and regional coalitions are uniquely situated to respond. And we know that cities play a significant role in climate change. Cities are responsible for between 70 and 75% of global energy related greenhouse gas emissions, um, inefficient, inefficient transportation, waste management, housing, energy, and urban design, inefficient urban design contribute to the large carbon footprint. Now, local government often has the regulatory power over these aspects of urban life, the power to create change. Cities are therefore where the action must play place. And they're also the areas that will boost most potentially benefit from efforts to, um, to mitigate this harm, um, like new technologies to reduce greenhouse emissions and increase jobs that go with those technologies. But cities are also uniquely aware of the needs of their communities, how climate change will disproportionately impact those within their community, as well as how to ensure that these efforts include those vulnerable members of the community so that as not to leave them behind. Now, part of being closely tied to the local community also means that in order for the community governments to take action, it has to reflect the will of the people and motivating uh, members of the community to care and be active is an important part of that, of ensuring and prioritizing that change. Now, today we are fortunate to have two panelists to share their work with us at the city level. Now, each panelist will present and we will follow their presentations with a Q&A session. Our first panelist is Kristen Hall. Ms. Hall holds a master's degree in environmental science from Cleveland State University and is the director of the City of Cleveland Mayor Office, Office of Sustainability. In this role, Ms. Hall oversees sustainability projects, programs, policy development, and grant administration for the city's municipal operations and the Sustainable Cleveland Initiative. She's currently chairing the Zero Waste Neo Working Group and has experience planning and implementing zero waste events. Ms. Hall. Uh, can you hear me? Awesome, okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that uh, introduction and I think um, especially following uh, some of the um, comments from 
Hillary, I think, uh, you know, hopefully I can give, give some examples of how one city is um, really trying to uh, serve as a convener to help bring our, uh, all of our residents together across all of those levels to really um, drive our, our sustainability and climate action efforts. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so just to start off with, I want to just share a little bit about our office, a little background in history. Uh, we were formed in 2005, um, originally under our public utilities office, um, and really the, it was one guy whose goal was to save enough money for our sustainability efforts to basically pay for his salary. Um, we've been fortunate over the years to be able to grow to uh, a staff of 10. We have actually two open positions right now, so a couple of the folks you see here have uh, since moved on, but um, you know we've got got great representation across all of the different areas of sustainability. Um, you can go to the next slide. And really the, the main thing that I want to share today is about our Sustainable Cleveland Initiative. Um, it was launched by Mayor Jackson in 2009. Um, <clears throat> really at the heart of the recession. We were, Cleveland was one of the cities hit very, very hard by the housing crisis. And, um, you know, we were at a point where our economy was, was kind of in the dumps. And, um, you know, the mayor recognized that we, especially as a, a Rust Belt city here in the Midwest, um, who has, you know, a heavy industry and manufacturing background, if we want to, you know, be a, a successful city moving forward, we have to do it in a more sustainable way. Um, and we also recognize that we, as the city of Cleveland, cannot do this on our own. Yes, we can, we can do as much as possible to lead by example, but if we don't have the buy-in from our residents, from our business community, our nonprofit organizations, our elected officials, I mean, really everybody, um, we're just spinning our wheels. We all need to kind of get together and, and work towards this um, collective vision of building a green city on a blue lake. You can go to the next slide. And one of the main ways that we did this is through our annual Sustainable Cleveland Summit. So Sustainable Cleveland kicked off in 2019 or in 2009, um, and it was originally called Sustainable Cleveland 2019. It was really, you know, an aggressive goal, a 10-year goal to uh, transform Cleveland into that green city on a blue lake that I mentioned um, by 2019, which is the 50th anniversary of the Cuyahoga River fire. So recognizing we're going to have a lot of attention on uh, Cleveland, we wanted to make sure sure that we were able to show all of the progress that we made, uh, especially in the environmental sphere. Um, so we have these annual summits. They are normally in person. Our last couple have been virtual. We bring, you know, anywhere from five to 600 folks together and Again, trying to represent as many diverse sectors, all walks of life as we can. Um, and, and we bring them into you know, a big room. We use appreciative inquiry. If you're not familiar with it, it's an approach that really focuses more on the positive And like I mentioned before, kind of that collective visioning. So if we're all working towards the same goal, we're going to be much more likely to be successful than if we're kind of doing our own separate things in our silos. Next slide. Um, Another way, you know, one of the, the kind of key things that has come out of these summits is we have a number of volunteer working groups that have formed, um, probably about 50 since 2009. And, you know, sometimes they finish their project and they kind of dissolve. But we've had, had a number of them, you can see up on the screen here, that have kind of graduated to become their own nonprofits. So um, the summits are really one of the key ways for us to um, bring people together, just have conversations, share ideas, and, and collectively kind of work towards these sustainability goals. Next slide. Um, and I think one of the, the big things that I definitely want to share is our Cleveland Climate Action Plan, um, because I think Sustainable Cleveland uh, really had an impact on how the Climate Action Plan was developed, and um, especially the, the intentional focus on equity that we, we placed with our 2018 update. So our original Climate Action Plan was created in 2013, but it was very much focused on emissions and cost savings, and there wasn't really much people kind of represented in, in that process. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so as we embarked on the update in 2018, um, it was really important for us to make sure that we were um, intentional in 
putting equity first and, and really building the plan with an equity lens throughout the whole process. So we had a 90 plus member climate action advisory committee. You can see some of the folks represented here. Um, one of the big things that we asked all of those folks to do was participate in, um, at a minimum, a half-day racial equity training through the Racial Equity Institute. Uh, it was called Groundwater. Um, or that we also had funding available where they could go through and do a full two-day uh, workshop as well. And a lot of that was just to make sure that we were all on the same page and speaking the same language. Um, I think many of us that work in this sphere have probably seen over the years that equity means different things to different people. And um, for us, it was really important that we had kind of a shared awareness of what many of our residents are experiencing here in Cleveland and making sure that that was really front of mind as we were working through, through the plan and the actions. Next slide. Um, and one of the, the big ways that we did this um, in, or one of the big ways that we really wanted to make sure we included our resident voices were through these neighborhood workshops. So we hosted 12 neighborhood workshops during the development of the plan. And a lot of it was really focused on um, not necessarily explaining what climate change was. Um, there was a little info about kind of climate science and distinguishing between climate and weather. Um, but it was really more about hearing from the community, what's important to you? What do you care about? Um, what, uh, what projects would you like to see? We were fortunate to partner with IOBI in our backyards that was able to provide some funding for 20 neighborhood level climate action projects. Um, and we've since been able to kind of uh, evolve our Cleveland Climate Action Fund to better support additional projects even since then. Um, over those 12 workshops, we had over 300 residents that were engaged, and really it was important for us to make sure that we were meeting people where they were. So uh, those meetings were hosted on evenings and weekends. We recognize that it's hard for folks during the workday to, to come to some of those. We tried to have a good balance of east side and west side so that uh, no one had to travel too far far um, food. I think we all know food brings people in and keeps them there, keeps them engaged. Um, and finally, child care as well, because I think uh, we have a number of parents that wanted to participate, but maybe didn't feel that they could come because they had kids with them. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> and finally, I just want to share, um, you know, our focus areas from the climate action plan. Um, one thing I'd like to point out here, if you look at the clean energy focus area, um, that one was originally, uh, the title of it was advanced and renewable energy. And I think we tried in very hard to make sure that the language in our climate action plan reflected what we were hearing from our community. So in every single one of those workshops, we heard the words clean, safe, and healthy. Every single one. So we, we changed the name of this focus area to just better reflect what, what our community was hearing. Uh, advanced and renewable can be really complicated, especially if you're not working in this sphere. So, um, you know, we, we tried throughout the whole document to really uh, reflect what we were hearing. Um, additionally, we have uh, a number of cross-cutting priorities. We recognize that there are some uh, actions in our plan that are, are geared towards advancing equity and making our residents more resilient to climate change, but they don't necessarily fit nicely into uh, any of the other buckets of our focus areas. Um, one piece that I do uh, want to point out is our racial equity tool. Um, we worked with the Urban Sustainability Directors Network and GARE, G-A-R-E, I'm not going to remember exactly what that acronym stands for, but um, to build this racial equity tool, um, I say it's a tool, it's really just a series of questions that we put all 107 actions in our climate action plan through, um, again, to make sure that equity was really front of mind in all of those. Uh, questions like, does the language in this action uh, resonate with the people in the community? Are there any unintended consequences that may come from this action that we may not think about that may unintentionally burden a certain population? Um, you know, so we, we really tried to make sure that we were um, putting that front of mind. And then even as we've moved past to implementation, we've evaluated those actions and tried to prioritize those that may have the, the greatest impact on equity. Next slide. Um, so I just want to highlight a couple areas where um, we're now starting to see some of this come 
come to fruition in terms of how we're implementing some of these projects. Um, this slide is a little blurry, I apologize, but um, in uh, as part of the Climate Action Plan, uh, Cleveland committed to a goal of 100% renewable energy by 2050, transitioning to that. Um, so earlier this year, we completed a report that kind of assessed that feasibility. What is it going to take for us to make that transition? Next slide. Um, and I think one of the big things that was most uh, revealing to us, uh, so our, our consultant GreenLink Analytics, who's based in Atlanta, we do love them, um, they're great to work with, highly recommend them, um, <clears throat> they produced this ACES tool. Um, I'm not going to do it justice, but essentially it's a, a very big algorithm that you put in these different scenarios, um, business as usual. If we don't do anything new, uh, to install more renewable energy, this is what we're looking at in terms of our fuel mix. Uh, the most cost effective, kind of a middle of the road, and then maximum, which is if we're doing 100% of everything that we can do. Um, one of the big things that, that stood out to us as we looked at this was um, even if we did everything that we could do, we put all of those numbers up to 100%, 100% uh, energy efficiency, 100% solar panels, wherever we could, um, Cleveland would still have to purchase renewable energy credits in order to make up that difference and meet, meet our goal. Um, it really has some big impacts and I think ties into um, what Hillary was talking about at the beginning um, at our state level. A lot of our state policies really prevent Cleveland, or, well, most Ohio cities from, um, from transitioning. Uh, if you've been following us, we've had some, some scandals around some of this that uh, I think we're still trying to work our way out of. And, um, you know, that really, for me, has, has an impact on then our voting and who we're putting into office who's ultimately going to be supporting some of this. Um, next slide. <clears throat> and, um, you know, through, through this process, it gave us a number of kind of policy actions that we're hoping to pursue. And of course, one of those is, of course, uh, state advocacy um, at that higher level. You can go next slide. A um, couple other projects. I want to share a Circular Cleveland initiative that uh, was launched just about a year ago. We uh, partnered with Cleveland Neighborhood Progress and Neighborhood Connections and received a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to really look at how we can transition Cleveland to a more circular economy. Um, and I, I may have a slide on this, so if I'm jumping ahead, I apologize. But, uh, you know, a circular economy for us means that we are designing out waste right from the beginning. Uh, so that we don't even have it to, to worry about at the end. Um, we're using products longer, keeping products in life longer, repairing things as opposed to replacing things, um, and, and ultimately, you know, trying to uh, reuse as much as we can and kind of close that loop. Um, so it was a pretty significant award. We got $475,000. we are about a year in, as I mentioned. We're working through our road mapping process now. Um, and, you know, like our climate action plan, there is an intentional focus on equity and community engagement. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And, uh, you know, some of the ways that that's uh, translating is through our Circular Cleveland ambassadors and some funding support for some uh, neighborhood grants uh, through neighborhood connections. Uh, a couple other elements that we were excited about is that this, pro again, this project provides funding for actual implementation. It's not just a planning process. So we also are going to have some dollars for composting at our historic Westside market, as well as through our economic development department to do some uh, small business incentives once our roadmap is complete. Next slide. And I mentioned um, our Circular Cleveland ambassadors. We have 12 of them representing uh, 10 neighborhoods in Cleveland. Uh, they have participated in all of our stakeholder engagement so far. They are kind of doing their own trainings and projects on their uh, kind of separately um, and, and are also providing input into this roadmap to make sure, um, you know, really at that grassroots level that uh, all of the 
initiatives and actions that are coming out of this roadmap are going to benefit as many of our uh, residents as possible. Additionally, we've awarded 14 uh, community grants so far, representing 40,000 plus in funding, um, which is really exciting for us because these are some projects that are starting to um, you know, show others how a circular economy can actually happen here in Cleveland. Um, and I'm happy to share any details on those projects. Uh, next slide. Um, oh, and I had mentioned our stakeholder engagement. Um, we've had over 100 plus folks engaged so far. And it's, you know, it's, I'm going to be honest, it's a little tricky. We have, you know, the public side and the private side. Uh, sometimes what the community wants doesn't always balance with what our private businesses and, you know, manufacturing sector may, may have as priorities. So um, that's really, you know, our job as the convener is to make sure that all of those voices are being heard um, and that they're being reflected in sort of the final actions that come out of our plan. Next slide. And I think my final example is our Cleveland tree plan. Uh, we are, Cleveland used to be referred to as the forest city. Unfortunately, however, our tree canopy is significantly declining. Um, even with all of the planting efforts we've been doing over the years, uh, we just have an aging canopy and we're really trying to be um, as strategic as possible in trying to restore that. Next slide. One of the main ways that we're doing that is through kind of our planting with a purpose. Uh, in 2017, our mayor committed $1 million a year for the next 10 years, so going out through 2027, uh, for tree planting. But, uh, you know, as we've interacted with our urban manager of urban forestry, um, really it's not about just planting but establishing those trees. They need to be um, – able to survive at least two years so that we can know that they're going to be able to, to grow and provide the canopy that we're, we're looking for. Um, some of the things, ways that we're trying to address this is, of course, the right tree in the right place. Um, so we have a dedicated list of approved species in our Cleveland tree plan um, and where those are supposed to go. Uh, I imagine uh, in Atlanta or like many urban cities, uh, we've got a variety of tree lawns. Some are six feet wide, some are two feet wide. Um, in some of those two feet wide ones, we have four foot wide trees planted. Um, that leads to a lot of sidewalk and road issues as well as utility issues. So we're trying to, again, make sure we're putting the right tree in the right place during the right season and maintaining them so that they, they do get established. However, these trees are not evenly distributed about, across our city. You can go to the next slide. Um, and I think our need is is very different. So uh, if you look at this map here, you can see, you know, we have a number of neighborhoods that are below average uh, tree canopy for, for the city. Um, but that, that represents a pretty broad uh, landscape or geographic kind of footprint when we're looking at that. Um, so this only looks, you know, when we look at this map, it's only looking at um, – tree canopy. It doesn't include any of the other health factors that are really important for us to be addressing and that we know trees can help to address um, when, when they're put in correctly. Um, things like, of course, racial equity, urban heat island, um, health outcomes, asthma, et cetera. You can go to the next slide. Um, so one of the things that we're doing uh, coming into our 2022 planting season is really trying to get much more deep or much more detailed in terms of what are the specific conditions at the census block groups or even the, the track level so that we can um, start to do more intentional planting. There's only so many tree lawns that the city of Cleveland is able to plant on, and we want to make sure we're doing those, um, putting them in the right places that are going to have the most benefits um, in the areas that have the most need. Um, we're using American Forest Tree Equity Score data, um, as well as a number of conditions that we've been pulling out just to, throughout all of our work. You can go to the next slide. Um, and you can see here... I'm hoping uh, go. This is just a, a quick summary of some of the data and the sources. You can go to the next one. But I think what's important to see is the, the level of detail. So uh, the one on the left represents sort of that first map I showed you. The one on the right is our more modified kind of tree equity score. And this helps us get down to, you know, 
blocks and say, all right, these are the blocks where we need to do our most planting because these neighborhoods have the, the most uh, incidence of asthma. They have the highest poverty rates in the city. It's uh, most urban heat island. Um, those types of things so that, again, we can be um, much more intentional and beneficial in the trees that we're planting. Next slide. So finally, I just want to share. So this is kind of our revised tree equity score that you can see looks a little different than that first map that I showed you and um, really helps us determine where we want to do the most plantings. Um, you know, obviously in the center here, there's a lot of red um, that represents our downtown area and kind of our industrial valley. Um, but, you know, even as you go just a little bit uh, east or west on either side of that, there are people that live in those neighborhoods. And even though they're close to the industrial valley, doesn't mean that they don't want or need the benefits of trees as well. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing kind of, uh, again, in our next planting season, how that all comes together and hopefully has some, some impacts on the health outcomes for our neighbors. Um, next slide, I think that might be it. For me. And thank with you, that, Hall. I want to thank you and I will turn it back to Sarah. And we'll have an opportunity to ask additional questions in this hall here in a moment. Um, oh, looks like we might be having a technical issue. Our next speaker is Alberto Rodriguez. Mr. Rodriguez is with the City of Seattle, Office of Sustainability and Environment and he leads the Duwamish Valley Program. His work largely focuses on community-led environmental restoration and community planning through an environmental justice and equity lens. In this role, he has led 18 city departments in the co-creation of the Duwamish Valley Action Plan, an environmental justice and equitable development and anti-displacement strategy. While previously working with the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition, a community-based nonprofit, he was part of a committee that developed the nation's first municipal-based equity and environmental agenda. I apologize if I pronounced that wrong. Duwamish, is that right? All right, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Arias. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. It's an honor, a pleasure um, to share space and um, time with you all. Um, my name is Alberto Rodriguez. I'm a strategic advisor with Seattle's Office of Sustainability and Environment, or OSC, and I co-lead a place-based interdepartmental uh, an interdisciplinary program to advance environmental justice and equitable development in Seattle's Duwamish Valley. Um, my history in the Duwamish Valley is long, and I'm using my air quotes here, uh, given that almost my entire professional career in the U.S. has been uh, working in the Duwamish Valley. I started start working with these with and for these communities in 2011. Uh, First as a volunteer, then as an intern, I graduated onto becoming a community organizer around uh, the cleanup of the Duwamish River Superfund site, uh, and then became a program manager. And just about a little, little over five years ago, I started working uh, for the city of Seattle. Uh, and I just give you this context. Uh, so you all know that my love and respect and admiration for and actually uh, the partnership with uh, the Duwamish Valley and its community leaders is longstanding. You know, it's a decade long at least. Um, and also my focus uh, today is to talk to you about this place and the city's work in this specific geography. Um, next slide, please. Uh, but, you know, it's like my office, again, the Office of Sustainability and Environment, uh, my office and my colleagues do amazing work citywide. Uh, in this slide, you can see most of our major initiatives and programs. You know, on the left, you see that we uh, strive to meet the climate challenge and we have uh, a few colleagues working on transportation electrification and also how to decarbonize uh, buildings and other uh, renewable energy efforts. Um, on the right, you see that we also uh, strive to grow sustainable communities. So uh, we have colleagues working on urban forests and food security programs and policy. And last but not least, uh, in the center, you know, uh, you can see that we also uh, uh, strive to champion equity and justice. And we have uh, the Equity Environment Initiative. We have a new, almost like just a few months old or maybe a year old Green New Deal effort. 
that some of my dear colleagues are, are leading. And um, last but not least, you know, Duwamish Ali program, which is um, what I'm gonna be uh, talking about today. I am super happy to connect you all with any of my colleagues leading any of this other work, should you be interested. But um, I honestly cannot speak with a lot of knowledge or authority about many of the specific details on uh, a lot of these initiatives uh, other than the Duwamish Ali program. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I love Seattle. Um, you know, I was uh, born and raised in Honduras. Uh, my entire family is still there. Uh, and I moved to Seattle more permanently in 2012. So I, I really, really, really mean this. You know, I feel incredibly lucky I live here. Uh, Seattle, Seattle has been identified as one of the most sustainable cities in the nation. You know, we are one of the best educated cities, we're one of the ones that provides the most opportunity for its residents and much, much more. We're, we're the home of Starbucks too, so I'm a big coffee drinker. Um, yet, within our city limits, there are places that experience socioeconomic conditions and have access to environmental benefits quite differently than other places. One of them is the Duwamish Valley, uh, which is the microcosm of where the combined impacts of climate change, racial inequities, and health disparities disproportionately affect uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, including immigrants and refugees, uh, and individuals with low incomes. For example, there is a full 13-year life expectancy difference between people who live in the neighborhoods of South Park and Georgetown which are located in Seattle's Duwamish Valley and other more affluent, less diverse neighborhoods, maybe five miles away. Uh, again, within Seattle city limits. Um, and as you can see in one of these images, you know, 100% of people who live in Georgetown live within half a mile of a documented polluted site, including a Superfund site, you know, one of the most toxic waste sites uh, in the nation. For these reasons, uh, community members and community leaders have been advocating and leading, and, and leading a lot of the work to improve quality of life in these neighborhoods for decades. And I, I really need to honor that because uh, I stand in the shoulders of giants. Um, and uh, also because this has resulted in the local government, you know, at least, you know, the city of Seattle and many in other uh, public agencies approaching our work differently. Uh, and by that, I mean in deep collaboration with community stakeholders. And this is what I'm, what I'm here to talk to you about. So next slide, please. Um, so after a one year long process to develop the first in the nation municipal equity and environment agenda in 2015, uh, and we developed that in partnership with those most affected by environmental injustice in Seattle, uh, the city launched this place-based interdepartmental interdisciplinary program called the Duwamish Valley Program in 2016. Uh, and that's when uh, I joined the city to lead this new, newly created uh, initiative. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a place-based and interdepartmental effort uh, to advance environmental justice and equitable development in the Duwamish Valley. And um, the work includes working with an interdisciplinary team of 18 city departments, and we strive to align and coordinate our work uh, in, this, uh, in this place. I will be remiss if I am not 100% clear that this is not uh, only my work. Uh, you know, this is, this is not just about me, you know, and I, I just really wanna give credit to all my colleagues who are leading and supporting this work, um, including, you know, uh, colleagues from our planning department, our utilities, our arts department, human services, our budget office, and many, many. I feel very lucky, you know, to be in humble to work with uh, such uh, talented, passionate, and compassionate uh, people. Uh, next slide, please. So the cornerstone of the Duwamish Valley program is uh, the Duwamish Valley Action Plan. You can see an image uh, on the left here. And the Duwamish Valley Action Plan is a city community shared vision that will guide the city's work and investments in the Duwamish Valley for years to come. A few things that I would like to mention about the action plan uh, before you go online and check it out, because you should, uh, you know, but these are a few things that I, I just kind of want to highlight um, about the action plan. You know, it was co-created uh, by more than 500 Duwamish Valley residents, workers, small merchants, and over a dozen federal, state, and local public agencies, foundations, academia, scientists, and nonprofit organizations. 
it includes six racial equity outcomes that we, you know, as a city have adopted in partnership with community stakeholders. And these are the North Stars or the heart of the work. And we really try to advance multiple, if not all of these through everything we do in the Duwamish Valley, no matter how small or big of an investment uh, we're talking about. Um, the action plan is organized in seven priority areas, you know, per community input. Um, uh, healthy environment, parks and open spaces, community capacity, mobility and transportation, economic opportunity and jobs, affordable housing, and public safety. And within the seven priority areas, you know, we have 50 near-term actions that we implemented in, from 2016 to mid-2018 to show responsiveness and build trust. Uh, the, the most of the action plan actually is um, 37 midterm strategies with almost 150 actions uh, with very specific budgets, lead departments, and timelines that we have been implementing uh, since the launch of the Duwamish Alley Action Plan in June of 2018. Uh, and next slide, please. Um, it also includes five long-term strategies for bigger ticket items that the city cannot actually uh, approach or do alone. Uh, and we will develop these uh, by 2023, or that was our commitment in 2018. Um, I am happy to report that we're in schedule to deliver on these on time. Uh, and um, I will be talking about um, some of these uh, for in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So I will be focusing the rest of my presentation mostly on climate change, specifically as it pertains to sea level rise adaptation. And, you know, the image on the center, you know, I know these are not like the best maps, but, you know, I just kind of want to focus, you know, it's like the image on the center shows the places that will be most affected by our, by our rising seas. Uh, given that uh, Seattle, if you haven't been here, uh, is a city of bluffs and hills, uh, things don't look uh, super bad, right? You know, it's mostly kind of like on some of the areas, you know, right around Puget Sound. But um, I want you to focus on this area on the south side, you know, that's uh, highlighted in red. And uh, the image on the right, you know, is a section of image on the left, but uh, with, uh, after we layer some of our equity considerations, and you can see that the area on the lower right, you know, which is actually the neighborhoods of Southwark and Georgetown, uh, will be disproportionately affected. Um, uh, next slide, please. And to give you an idea of kind of like how this, what this looks uh, or what it will look in a few years. Um, uh, I have this slide, it's a busy slide. So I just wanted to you to focus on a couple of things here. Um, on the upper right hand corner, you can see what the annual high tide is projected to be in the industrial area of South Park by 2050. And I'm gonna repeat myself here. Uh, in the industrial area of South Park by 2050, uh, which will actually become the daily high tide by 2100. So a lot, of, a lot of the industrial area in Southport will be underwater, right? Or experiencing like uh, extreme flooding. Um, on the table on the left, you know, you can see the water levels at different points in time. Uh, but briefly, you know, the one thing, the message that I wanna convey here is that we expect up to three feet of uh, sea level rise uh, every day and up to six feet of increased sea level rise during heavy storms by 2100. Um, the next slide, please. Given all of this, uh, we're kind of like uh, approaching or trying to launch like a new phase of the, of, of the work. You know, we're calling it Duwamish Alley Program 2.0. Um, and basically what we mean is that we really want to expand or deepen our work in the following ways. Uh, first, you know, it's like we want to, uh, in terms of partners, you know, um, we have been mostly getting our house in order. So it's been a, a very internal city focused effort. Uh, you know, that 18 city departments, uh, we collectively call ourselves the Duwamish Valley Action Team. Uh, so very city focused and we have been, we prioritize, you know, working and collaborating, partnering with residents, you know, the residential community stakeholders. But given the image that I just showed you, you know, uh, it's very evident that we need to start working more closely with our industrial stakeholders also in this neighborhood. And we're really trying to be intentional about bringing others, you know, uh, that have interests and that can actually help us tackle this, uh, 
this issue, you know, climate change, you know, such as other public agencies, philanthropy, and, and et cetera. In terms of the geography, I think I mentioned this, uh, you know, we've been focusing most of work in the residential areas, given that they are the ones that are experiencing or have been experiencing health disparities, racial inequities for well over a century. Uh, but, you know, given that sea level rise will disproportionately affect the industrial areas, we need to uh, work in industrial, they're in, the, in the industrial areas of the neighborhoods. Um, it also something that uh, we learn um, during the development of the action plan is that we didn't engage as much with our tribal stakeholders. So uh, we are being uh, very proactive about working with the Duwamish tribe uh, this time around. Um, in terms of investments, you know, the level of investments coming down the pike in the next 10 years is substantial, you know, uh, not counting the river cleanup or the Superfund cleanup, uh, it will be more than 100 million. Uh, so this will allow us to actually uh, tackle um, really challenging issues and work on upstream solutions, you know, not at this project based, this project based approach that we had um, in the past several years and really pair, gives us an opportunity to pair climate change work with other community priorities such as anti-displacement strategies, you know, uh, improving health and others. Next slide, please. Um, uh, Kristen, I was just thinking about this actually when you started presenting, but you know, uh, we are in, we're like, I guess sister cities or something, but uh, we are very fortunate that in late 2020, we received a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So we're part of the same cohort. Uh, and um, the grant is to actually work on a comprehensive climate and community resilience strategy. Uh, this will allow us to implement a vision that we have co-developed uh, with community, you know, more specifically the residential partners in the Duwamish Valley. And, you know, the working title right now is uh, Duwamish Valley Resilience District. I am super, super, super proud this, uh, about this award because this was uh, a global competition. Only six projects were funded and uh, Seattle was funded uh, at the maximum level uh, allowed. And um, it also sheds even more light uh, on the amazing work that the community leaders have been leading for decades, you know, in this area. And uh, also, you know, the work that the city has done in the past years to support it. Uh, uh, there are some images of some of our closest partners right now, but I'm not going to go into detail there. Uh, let me know if you have any questions later. Um, next slide, please. And, uh, you know, another busy slide, but, you know, these are like the main kind of like things that I want to convey with this is that, uh, number one, you know, this work takes uh, years. So this is a multi-year journey that we have embarked on. And the last thing is that you can see, oh, actually messed up some of the format but uh you can see kind of like this this arc right and um the work right now is mostly being led by the city uh but our vision is that we're actually building working with community building community power so that they are actually the ones that are shepherding this community and climate resilience efforts for years to come uh we envision that this resilience district will be um established in the next two to three years. Um, and I will be talking a little bit more about some of our vision and our hypotheses that we're actually looking into um, right now uh, with the support of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. So um, yes, it, you know, back in 2020, you know, Duwamish Valley program team applied and, for and received funding to embark on this climate change adaptation planning in a holistic way, uh, one that addresses community priorities, but also promotes health equity uh, by centering the voices and needs of, of Black, Indigenous, people of color, and low-income individuals. Um, the funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation will support the city to advance, you know, elements of the resilience district. And what is this resilience district thing? You know, the resilience district is a geographic strategy inspired by global models focused on adapting to flood risk and other climate change impacts uh, as a key, first key steps towards adapting to a changing climate. Uh, but we also kind of really want to take like a comprehensive approach that supports community resilience, supports and builds community resilience. Um, the way in which we're talking about it uh, is that, you know, the work includes the following kinds of infrastructures. Um, and I'm going to start with the one at the center, you know, with the physical infrastructure, you know, we aim to develop a holistic sea level rise adaptation strategy, uh, including preferred physical infrastructure to protect the Duwamish Valley communities uh, from sea level rise. 
the team will evaluate best practices and learn from Regenerate, Regenerate Christchurch, uh, specifically their Otakaro Avon River Corridor Regeneration Plan in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, I'm going to move to uh, the far right, you know, and talk about financial infrastructure. We're really aiming to identify the possibility of using land value capture, you know, mechanisms to finance, you know, the the infrastructure that I just mentioned um, that will protect our residents and industries from sea level rise impact, but also to fund improvements that will improve the health uh, and equity outcomes in these two neighborhoods or in this area, you know, such as housing, affordable housing, parks, workforce development, and other. Um, we're being inspired and we want to evaluate and uh, best practices and learn from the Agua Esprayada uh, Joint Urban Operation in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, for this work. And last but not least on the uh, on the left, you know, the organizational infrastructure, you know, we are really interested in establishing a shared decision making framework, uh, the centers the voices of uh, needs of, you know, or black indigenous people of color, low income individuals in the Duwamish Valley, and those industries most affected by sea level rise. Um, we will evaluate replicating best practices and learning from Proyecto Enlace del Caño Martín Peña in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, Enlace provides a very unique and excellent model of where a municipality established a special planning district and entered into a formal into a formal partnership with nonprofit with a nonprofit coalition uh, whose goal is to was to ensure is to ensure uh, the participation of residents in the decision making processes of the district. Uh, and I'm going to close with kind of like this, you know, it's just like these multi-million dollar investments that the city will make in the Duwamish Valley in the next 10 or so years really provide an opportunity to capture value from uh, the public investments uh, and reinvest them in infrastructure programs and projects that provide public benefit. You know, the city will make most of these investments in an industrial area. And many of these industrial stakeholders are responsible for the existing health disparities and racial inequities that the residential stakeholders have been bearing the brunt for, for literally over a century. Uh, we're trying to be as intentional uh, as we can to ensure that we equitably distribute benefits and do not create a windfall to industrial stakeholders. Um, and uh, for this, you know, we really need to find an approach that does not exacerbate and perpetuate the disparities and inequities that have been present for. Again, uh, repeating myself here for well over a century. Uh, I have, uh, I can keep talking about this for hours, so I'm gonna leave it at that and I'm gonna give it back to Sarah. Thank you. We now have time for questions and answers. Um, for those joining us today, you can submit your questions through the Q&A or through the chat. We'll go ahead and start off. Got a, some questions for both of you. Uh, Kristen, let's start with you. Um, you mentioned the 2018 change where you put, placed an equity focus. Can you tell us what really motivated that change? Yeah, uh, I think I would give a lot of credit to Cleveland Neighborhood Progress. Uh, they are one of our local nonprofit organizations and have really been a partner with us for probably 10 years. Um, around the time that we were trying to secure funding for our Climate Action Plan update, um, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, or you'll hear me call them CNP, um, CNP was on uh, I believe they called it in a racial equity awareness campaign. So throughout the community, you know, as I mentioned um, with our climate action advisory committee, we had uh, all of those folks go through a half day racial equity training workshop. Um, CNP at the time was it offering these workshops throughout the whole community. And again, their, their motivation behind it was we need everyone kind of talking the same language. And, um, you know, if we want to make equity, um, you know, a, a bigger piece of, of any of our work, we all need to be on the same page in terms of what it means. Um, and I think recognizing that equity and equality are not the same thing. Um, and some of our uh, historical uh, racism and structural racism has really impacted 
what that you know what those definitions mean today and and how we move them forward. So um, you know I think for us. Uh, Equity has always been one of those kind of three E's in sustainability, but uh, a lot of our focus had been on sort of projects and cost savings, and it was just really a good opportunity to make sure that people people were coming first. Do you feel that if you had if you had started off with the equity focus, do you think you would have had the same level of initial support versus putting the focus on the economic benefits, or would that be hard to hard to speculate on? Um, I, so I'm, are you saying like with our t very first climate action plan? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think at the time it would, I don't know that we would have been quite as successful. Um, and I think some of that's just what I've been seeing in the evolution of the sustainability field as a whole. Um, you know, in, in some of the, you know, about a decade or so ago, um, the the dollars and cents, the triple bottom line were, were the big things that um, were very concrete, I think, and easy to, to sort of wrap your head around. Some of the, the social side is a little bit harder, I think, for some of our stakeholders to maybe make those connections. Um, so I would say we probably would not have been as successful or maybe had as much support for, say, the next iteration of our plan. Roberta, did you, did you find that I mean, it sounds like you started out with more of an equity focus in Seattle. Um, did you find that posed any barriers versus the economic benefits? I don't think it, it posed any barriers. You know, I think, you know, it's like uh, centering equity is, is, is the work, right? It, it doesn't have to be different work. Uh, I think we, we were in a different moment in time in which, you know, uh, some of us, you know, some of my colleagues, some of us, you know, did not know how to truly embed, you know, racial equity and come up with racial equity outcomes. We were just doing business as usual, right? So uh, it just took more time uh, to come up with, in my opinion, at least, you know, better solutions uh, that are uh, shared, you know, priorities that advance both the city and the communities, you know, those most affected uh, by climate change and health disparities, racial inequities. So I, I think that the barrier, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if it's, I would call it a barrier, but you know, it was like that, that we needed more time to really uh, come up with better solutions. And, but I, I think that pays uh, over time. We have a question from the audience. How do you get people to buy into health equity in the environmental health space? Ooh, um, I can I guess going. Uh, you know, um, I think it's it's uh, it, it has to do a lot with the language that we use and the narratives and the frameworks, right? Um, you, if you go and when you go, because I know you will, and review, let's say the Duwamish Valley Action Plan. You know, it's like you're gonna find the word climate. Uh, maybe five times. And if you look at it comprehensively, you know, this is a, a climate uh, resilience kind of like plan as well. We're not calling it that way because, you know, our community partners, those who we prioritize, we're not calling it that. Uh, but in terms of health, you know, I'm, 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 maybe I'm giving you apples to oranges, you know, it's like, um, community members, you know, we're not necessarily in the Duwamish Valley at least specifically, uh, and through the creation of the equity and environment agenda, we're not necessarily using the words environment sustainability, that we're using health equity, right? So um, it, I think it comes from community. Uh, community members led the creation of several studies, at least in Blomish Valley, there's a cumulative health impact analysis, a health impact assessment, and so on and so forth. So that comes, right? We need to follow suit as, as, as a public servants to kind of like where the community's at. And to be honest, health equity in my opinion, is climate work, is anti-displacement work, is sustainability and environmental work. Uh, so we're doing the work, we're just calling it different things uh, sometimes. Kristen, do you have any thoughts on that question? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that I'm maybe most excited about that is um, to come here in Cleveland is, uh, we just recently hired a, and created a new um, division within our health department. Um, so we have a new commissioner of um, health equity and social justice. 
and I feel like I'm maybe missing one other uh, <laughs> phrase in her title. It's a it's a long one, but um, you know I think her uh, her focus is going to be how do we embed health equity in all of the work that we do. So you know building off of Alberto's point. Um, it's not just a sustainability thing. It's a housing thing. It's a utility thing. It's uh, an access to green space thing. Um, so I, I'm very excited that it's not that all of this work is not necessarily falling on the Office of Sustainability via the Climate Action Plan, but um, that we're going to have a lot more um, alignment in our efforts uh, across a number of different city departments. Because I think if you address some of those health challenges, some, uh, you know, as Alberto mentioned, climate, I think, is now, if we deal with climate stuff, it's going to address some of those health challenges. But I think there's also other ways outside of just the environment that we can address them. Um, and those two are going to make us more prepared for climate change. Thank you. Now, you guys both mentioned at different times uh, situations where maybe certain members of the community had different goals or a different vision than some of your stakeholders. How do you work together to align their visions and needs? Maybe Kristen, if you would start. Um, I think uh, the the first step is listening, um, and it is and sometimes it's I hate to say it, bringing outside facilitators in. Um, you know, I will be transparent with you all. I sometimes have a hard time being a facilitator working for a city because uh, ideas will come up. Um, for example, at our summits, uh, I remember many years ago folks saying, like, we should have curbside composting collection. And I'm going, yes, that would be amazing. But we don't even have our recycling, curbside recycling rolled out citywide yet. So it was very hard for me to be like, yeah. We're gonna we're gonna do that for sure. Um, so I think having outside facilitators in some of those conversations, and we did those for our climate action workshops and um, the circular Cleveland engagement we've been doing, um, to just I think give folks a little bit more space to be open. Uh, I think again, if they see me as a city person. Um, they may not share all of the thoughts that they have because of their just historical experiences with the city, different city departments. And that it may not be from a sustainability perspective, but if you had a bad experience trying to pay your water bill, you've sort of written off the whole city anyway is, um, you know, being somebody that's there to, to help. So um, having those outside folks then uh, lets us hear the real, real feedback from the community and make sure that we're um, incorporating some of that into whatever work that we may be doing. Alberta? This is a, a very good question, uh, Sarah. Um, uh, I'm grappling a little bit to best answer it. And I think I'm gonna begin with not directly answering your question, but answering something else. Uh, and it is that um, even with, if there are differences between priorities and um, between different stakeholders, you know, it's like, at least in my job and with through my office and the Duan Shelley program, we really center the voices of those that have been most affected by climate change, health disparities and racial inequities. So uh, even if other powerful stakeholders or influential stakeholders have very different opinion, you know, we really try to come back to this and find a common ground and really address and prioritize those voices. Again, of those that have been most affected historically by racial inequities, health disparities, and will be affected by climate change. So uh, that is not giving answer to your question about how you bring people together, but I think it's something that we need to be real about. And when we boast and talk about environmental justice, health equity, and things like that, uh, there's gonna be moments in time when, when all of us will need to make decisions and prioritize certain voices, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I've been lucky, uh, I think so far within my job that um, while I work with this interdisciplinary team that sometimes have different opinions, kind of like, you know, with utilities and arts and planning and neighborhoods and whatever, you know, it's like we, we are a city family, right? And we have more common, more things in common, you know, like we are mandated as city of Seattle employees to center race in our work, right? And all of our work, we have a race and social justice initiative that's been in place for 
over 20 years. So nobody can come back to me and say, oh no, you know, uh, all lives matter uh, or something similar because, you know, we are mandated as a, I'm mandated as a public servant to center race on our decision making. Um, so anyhow, uh, so in the city family, you know, there's been more, com there's more commonalities. We have initiatives, we have mandates that we need to follow. Uh, I think it's gonna be very interesting to be quite honest. Uh, the, this next phase of the work, as I was mentioning, uh, mostly between like the difference, the potential difference in opinions or priorities between the industrial stakeholders and the residential stakeholders. Uh, and that is something that we will be delving into. So stay tuned and invite me back and I will uh, come back to you and, and, and report back on kind of like how we managed to uh, move the work forward, right? Uh, we're just beginning. So I don't have a lot uh, to say in that matter yet. I was gonna um, ask think, questions about state and local next too, but I, I think Kristen has a question for you, Alberto. Uh, I have a question and I guess just uh, to kind of wrap up on that, uh, the, the previous question, one other piece I would add is um, our, our office has been um, very intentional about relationship building over the last decade and um, really growing our, our network of trusted partners that um, recognize what what we are trying to do and hopefully uh, maybe set us aside from some of those other city departments that they may have not had the most positive experiences. Um, so, you know, I find that that's really beneficial when we do um, need to, to get in the community, host a community meeting. We can go to them. They will let us know what events are coming. This is probably the best one for you to attend because it's going to have the most folks who are going to, you know, be able to listen to your message or whatever the case may be. Um, so I find those partnerships have really made um, our office in particular uh, very successful in um, kind of advancing some of our sustainability initiatives. Um, so now, Alberto, the question that I have for you, it's uh, maybe a little off topic, but I'm just more curious because we have a lot of similarities here in Cleveland. You shared a map showing sea level rise uh, and what is it's expected to look like almost daily uh, in an industrial area. And um, from what I can tell, it looks like there's going to be a number of buildings underwater um, in the next 50 years. What are you doing? You know, I guess I, I find myself in an interesting position or, you know, just as a city person, I'm like, well, that's kind of those businesses issues. You chose to locate yourself in a, a lower area, um, but then they ultimately are going to need to relocate. And Sometimes that may mean closer to residential areas, et cetera. Um, just, you know, I guess high level, how are you approaching that with some of those folks to um, make sure that they know kind of what's coming and uh, ultimately mitigate any of the impacts if they do move, say, closer to residents? So uh, there's, so they are already uh, in a residential area, right? In Duwamish Valley, it was actually both neighborhoods of so South Park and Georgetown are older than the city of Seattle itself. This is where actually the Danny, many of the settlers, you know, European settlers in the 1850s actually settled. The first settlements were in the Duwamish Valley. Uh, so, and there was actually an effort to kick out the residential stakeholders out of the Duwamish Valley and make these neighborhoods fully industrial. This is, I believe, don't quote me on the, the, on the year, but maybe 1930s, 1940s, uh, and they were, not successful, right? So there's these pockets of residential areas and industrial stakeholders that have been cited really adjacent to, you know, there's actually residential houses in parts of the neighborhoods that are in between uh, industries, kind of like industrial buildings. So, um, so going back to your question is, you know, it's like, we are really just starting with this work, uh, the planning of sea level rise. So I don't have a very clear answer for you, but I, I can tell you kind of like our hypothesis and approach a little bit, you know, we, this is the first time, this is the first place where we're going to begin planning for sea level rise in Seattle. Uh, and we are approaching this from an anti-displacement, uh, perspective, and that includes industries and residents, right? So we cannot talk about anti-displacement with residents if we're not talking about protecting our industrial stakeholders, right, as well, or we don't think it's, that's a hypothesis that we have. Um, so the way in which we're, so again, I think it's honestly a combination of retreat. Some people will have to retreat no matter what, uh, but we are really hoping to keep as many of the industries and residents where they're at, right, and protect them. 
Uh, most likely my dream is a multi-purpose berm where on one side you can do kind of like oyster, kind of like whatever thing, have a trail on top, you know, blue water infrastructure, D don't get me going. But that is kind of like our, our hypothesis right now. Um, so that is where, where we're at. You know, we will begin with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, you know, like detailed scenario planning, figuring out specifically where, you know, this it's, is it seeping from underneath? Is it's overtopping of the river, blah, 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 blah. So um, I will have more to report back on that as well. But uh, again, the, the, the thing is that we're really approaching it from an anti-displacement approach and we wanna protect our residential industrial stakeholders. How much or how many of those will be protected? We don't know yet, but we're very hopeful that uh, the majority will. So we're gonna keep businesses and people in place. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that you're thinking about it now uh, before it becomes too much of an issue. And the, the last thing I'm going to say, you know, it's like uh, our public utilities, Seattle Public Utilities is actually already in our Department of Transportation already making a bunch of improvements to protect some of these industries. So let's say there is a pump station, the South Park pump station that's being built uh, to help with some of the flooding issues that we're experiencing today. Um, so anyhow, we're already taking some actions there and we're thinking about, oh, elevating streets or whatever, you know, but uh, more work will be happening in the next few years. You pose an interesting question or one came to mind, I guess, when you were when you were talking about the potential of displacement. And obviously that's your goal is to not have anyone be displaced, but with displacement, there comes an opportunity to rebuild or an obligation, I guess, to have to rebuild. We had originally another panelist who was going to join us today who comes from a small town of Greenberg, Kansas. I don't know if either of you have ever heard of Greenberg. Um, it was, it's a small town of 1,500 some people originally. And in 2007, they were hit with a tornado and it decimated 90% of their town. And when they built back, they decided to build back fully green. And they had to, of course, get a commitment from everyone who was staying in that community to really invest in this um, and adopt it as a way of life. Um, and one of the things I was hoping to actually talk about with the former mayor of Greenberg was to say, is it harder, do you think, when you have to step into an existing structure then if you have the opportunity to create something new or um, because of, for example, rising waters, if you have to move, is that an easier place to start from to say, now we're gonna do it this way, we're gonna invest versus kind of creeping into people's day-to-day -day life and saying, hey, how about we take these small steps? How about we do this a little bit different? What do you guys think in your experience? Um, I can take a Sorry, first yes, jump Kristen. <laughs> and uh, give maybe Alberta some time to think about it, because that's a, a great question, Sarah. And I think, um, you know, it's something that as a sustain, you know, municipal sustainability professional, um, I think we're faced with a lot because even, you know, as Alberto was sharing his um, the Duwamish Valley action plan, you know, I was making notes about the, the near-term actions, the mid-term and the long-term actions. And I think um, that sort of breakdown helps, uh, may, may help us kind of talk about this issue um, in, a, in an easier way. So there's, there's little easy things that we can get our residents to do. Um, but when it does come to some of these big civic issues, um, I guess I don't, I'm going to say, I don't know which approach is better. I think there it's pros and cons, depending on the particular situation you're in. Um, you know, Cleveland is a, a heavily urbanized, we're pretty built out. Um, so we don't always have the, the luxury of build, building new things or starting from scratch. Sometimes we're kind of working with what we have. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's one of those things I think of how I uh, present things to an audience. If I've got, you know, maybe a project proposal, I like to at least give them something to react to rather than um, just tell me what you think and an open blank slate. So it does sometimes help having something to build off of that you can modify and tweak. Um, and, and I think that's just, at least, you know, I have to say in Cleveland, what we are faced with um, as opposed to kind of just starting from scratch. I hope I explained that as, and maybe Alberto can provide a little more uh, 
uh, insight on that. Uh, I'm not sure if you're going to like my answer, but um, I think it depends, right? You know, it's like, and I'll give you two examples, right? Uh, with sea level rise adaptation, and it's been very hyper focused in Duwamish Alley, I have no option, to be honest, to kind of like start anew, right? Our industrial lands uh, have a super high occupancy rate, you know, it's like 95%, you know, they're an incredible source of income for the city, for the county, for the state. So, you know, we need to protect them because they're an important stakeholder. And even the residents, you know, they will tell you, you know, it's like, these are part of the community. You know, we work here, we do a bunch of the stuff. So we want to keep them there. So I think it's uh, for sea level rise in this um, example, it has to be gradual, right? And it has to be co-developed, co-planned, co-designed, co-implemented. Um, but then, you know, I'm also thinking, this may not be a super clear answer, but you know, it's like, I also see the, the need and that it's actually imperative sometimes to start from scratch, you know, like some of the policies that we have in place, you know, have purposefully <laughs> disenfranchised, you know, and created health disparities, racial inequity, you know, we're talking about voting and all this stuff. And with some of those things, we really just need to, in my opinion, uh, do, a, you know, land use, zoning, uh, many other things, you know, we, we may have to rethink, you know, do away with and rethink and co-create those from the ground up. Uh, but, you know, how realistic that is, I am, I am not sure, but I see the value in both approaches depending on the situation. Uh, I'm being very wishy-washy today, I guess. I've been working for the city for too long these days. It depends is the classic lawyer answer. So I think it makes perfect sense. You always say it depends. Um, well, thank you both for that. Uh, another question from the audience. How do we keep health equity and environmental health at the forefront of the agenda should political agendas change? So I think this general idea that, you know, working in government, you're going to have new leadership. With leadership comes change. How do you keep it at the forefront? Kristen um, looks like she's ready. Uh, yes, uh, I, I was pointing at myself. Uh, we are... Uh, facing a mayoral election next week here in Cleveland. And it sounds like Alberta is as well. Um, we're a little unique in that uh, our current mayor, Mayor Jackson, has been uh, in office for 16 years. And uh, that is, uh, it's historic. He has been an, an awesome leader for sustainability, but um, it means we're going to see a lot of change in the, the next couple of months here. And, um, you know, especially from our office, it, it leaves us with a sense of uncertainty. What's going to happen? Um, I think both of our uh, current candidates appreciate and uh, want to elevate sustainability and equity uh, throughout all of the work that they do. Um, so, uh, you know, I see it as, as my responsibility um, as director of sustainability to prepare them when they come on to say, here's what we've been doing and here's the 15 to 20 things that we need to be doing and we need your leadership support to uh, make sure that we're driving this forward. And here's the the hurdles that we've been facing. Histo you know, I, I'm fortunate to have been in the office for uh over a decade now. So I have a lot of that just institutional knowledge of, you know, here's all the things we've wanted to do. Uh, and here's all of the barriers that have prevented us from doing them. Um, you know, you tell me, new mayor, what, what you want to prioritize. And I will tell you what I need from your leadership team and the administration to make sure that we're, we're driving those things forward. So, um, you know, it's, uh, and I, I guess I would say it needs to be as digestible as possible. So my thought is that list of 15 things isn't going to take up more than two pages of text. Because, uh, yes, you could go read the climate action plan, but are you going to? You're coming on as mayor. you got enough other things on your list. If you can just read a two-page document that really highlights it, and then when you have questions, come to me. I'll give you the deets. We'll go from there. Um, that's uh, at least what I'm planning. We'll see what happens next week, but um, you know, being prepared and telling them this is what we have in place, and I think that helps them from maybe disrupting too much, or can give them the opportunity to support uh, existing initiatives that we already have underway. Thank you, Kristen. Alberto. So I'm going to give you two answers to this question. You know, part A is. Uh, 
going back to, I think a comment that I made earlier today, and it depends on like the language that we're using, right? Uh, if the mayor, if there's a mayor that doesn't believe in climate change, then we call it whatever, renewable energy, clean energy, weatherization plus health, whatever, right? So the language that we use, I think it's important and uh, it matters, I think, right? I, personally, you know, my, this may not be ideal, but when, the community members that you work with and for are dying 13 years younger. I, I honestly care more about the work and getting stuff done and not necessarily what we call it, right? Um, so I think language is something that, you know, we can use. Uh, and uh, then the second part of my answer is, you know, I, I've, I've been an organizer, you know, in community, part of my job is organizing city staff these days, right? Uh, and so organizing, relationships and trust, I think are important because the inside outside strategy is real, right? So if I am trying to elevate things that the community has been asking for, for decades in some cases, you know, and it's not going anywhere, you know, internally, then the community, you know, civic engagement is where it comes to, to you know, to play. So these people are accountable. They're being elected, right? They wanna be reelected some of them. Uh, so that's where community members can organize, right, and elevate and make sure that that is a priority. I cannot tell, you know, community members to organize, but, uh, you know, we're in the middle of budget season right now, and also, and we will have a, an election coming up, and uh, some people, we were, the mayor announced like a multi-million dollar package uh, of investments, you know, for Duong Shali and her proposed budget, and uh, community members were telling me, how do we make sure, you know, they were asking, how do we make sure that these are, and I'm like, I cannot tell you to advocate uh, or how to, but I can tell you what I have seen other people do in the past, right? So anyhow, you know, the, the inside outside strategy, relationship building trust is, is real. And I am lucky that I have a decade, you know, working with these communities within this four in different capacities. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, trust there and relationships that uh, help us advance in a collective agenda together. I have a question to either one of the panelists, uh, just quickly, and I think Alberto alluded to it in terms of um, the the steps you can take and the strategy uh, that you can map out. For those uh, individuals, I believe we have a few individuals who are from spaces, locations, and uh, jurisdictions that aren't as friendly as um, city of Cleveland, city of Seattle, uh, and are not in a, 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 a I can say, a, just an open sphere, as she talked about. And, and so how would one propose to an uh, individual without just talking about language changing, but even getting in front of, getting to the table, right? Getting at the door before you even come to the table. How do you start to, to strategize? How do I make this kind of applicable or something that's really uh, needs to be addressed to a, an area, to policymakers, to um, those who are appointed and elected to talk about climate change, EJ, and really impacting BIPOC communities. How, how do you even get in front of a, a, of, of a mayor or a legislator or a school superintendent or housing, you know, uh, official where you need to really talk about, you know, but reframing it with language, but also we know with language action, right? And strategy. So how do you start to do that and start to talk about that? Kristen, do you want me to start? Yeah, yeah I, I, I can get us going. Uh, you know, and I will take off my hat as a city employee and I put on my former community organizer hat. Okay. Uh, Cause you know, I used to be that person, that community advocate that was a pain on the neck uh, sometimes. Uh, and um, so, and we used to have uh, a very hard time elevating the priorities uh, from Guamish Alley communities in front of our elected officials back then, back in that time. Uh, so, there was, you know, we knew that health disparities, racial inequities were real. Community members live them every day, right? right? They experience them every day. And we used to go to city council. We used to go to the former mayors and, and they were like, Where, where's the data, you know, show yeah. us. And right. I'm like, well, you should be kind of like looking into this, not us, but we'll take you up on that. So I'm, I'll give you this example, right? In 2012, we, we were solely focused before then on the Superfund cleanup, you know, levels of PCBs, arsenic, 
dioxins and stuff like that. And then per community input, we broaden our perspective on this like healthy communities initiative. And we uh, led the creation or development of a health impact assessment for the river cleanup. We led simultaneously the creation or development of a, or we did a Duwamish Valley cumulative health impact analysis, right? And this CHIA, the cumulative health impact analysis, that's a document that for the first time we highlighted a full 13 years life expectancy difference between neighborhoods within Seattle city limits, right? And that frame and going all big and writing public testimony and writing some articles and editorials in the Seattle Times and other things really caught the attention uh, of our elected officials. And that kind of like started the approach at the city, you know, started changing. You know, there was a resolution, you know, more focused on the Duwamish Valley in 2015, equity and environment agenda, Duwamish Valley program, so on and so forth, multi-year, right, um, effort. but there are strategies from outside and, and these elected officials need to look good most of them want to be reelected. so right. uh, there are pinch points that you and strategies that you can use to really get their attention um so that's what i have to offer Great. for now Kristen, um i think the phrase i'll use and i'm i'm stealing it from our uh deputy chief of operations is municipal judo um where uh, I think in some ways I find that um, when there's stuff I want to, so I, I'm thinking now from the city, but I will put my civic hat on, my, my resident hat on in just a second as well. Um, there are a lot of initiatives that I want to move forward. And then when I take them to a department, they give me a laundry list of all of the reasons that they can't do it, um, citing staffing, capacity, funding, operational chain challenges, et cetera. Um, so I've kind of tweaked my approach to where I um, just hint at things more than kind of coming right out at them. I, I like to sort of inception people and think, make them think it's their idea. And then they come to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, we're going to give you so much support. Let's definitely do that. Um, okay. <laughs> however, that's, that's me as, uh, you know, a sustain someone that's embedded in the, the organization. Um, if you're outside of the city, if you're just a resident that wants to see some change, it can be intimidating. I think it's really hard to say, you know, see like, what is that pathway I need to follow? And, um, I would just encourage those individuals to have conversations with your friends, family, and neighbors. Um, just start to talk about it. What are those things that you want to see? Um, you'd be surprised. Some of them may have suggestions of folks to talk to. Maybe it's your council person. Maybe it's local business leaders. You'd be surprised when, when your business community is demanding things. Um, and especially as you think of the impacts of climate change on businesses, um, from you know reliability of power, um, access to clean water, transportation challenges, et cetera. Um, for, for some reason, our elected officials seem to be much more willing to listen sometimes to those business leaders than some of our residents. But um, you know, I think it's, it's sometimes just keeping that conversation going. Um, I think I'd also just advise, you know, settle in that it's not going to be an easy, process it, it will likely not be an easy process we'll put it that way you know it may require talking about these issues multiple times bringing them up at community meetings multiple times but um the more you share those i uh heard from from one of our local community leaders um if you have an idea share it and then share it with someone else and share it with someone else. And those are the ways that your ideas start to materialize and the the more kind of support, the bigger network you have, um, the more that voice gets elevated and becomes something that uh, our, our community leaders hear as what our community wants and needs. So that's, that's my two cents. Thank you, Kristen. Whoa. I like that. I mean, what I got out of that is municipal judo. That's what I got. <laughs> I've heard of political Jedi mind tricks, but municipal judo, I'm going to take that <laughs> and run with it. Thank you. Thank you both. We have one more question from the audience, and then I have a closeout question for you guys. Um, the question from the audience member is, how do we initiate health equity and environmental health at the beginning stages, for example, at the elementary level, so that this becomes a part of people as uh, they grow? And Kristen, you want to take it? 
Yeah, and I, I'm happy to, to take a first crack in, with perhaps maybe an asterisk because I would say our um, CMSD, our municipal uh, school district, is – is a nut that I've been trying to crack for a while. And um, I think that what, what we have seen is they don't have sort of dedicated staff that are necessarily working on some of this. Um, I, to their credit, uh, we are seeing much more um, emphasis on just um, – a, a student's experience and um, recognizing things like trauma and uh, other other challenges that a student faces um, when they're in kind of the classroom setting um, so that, you know, we can better address some of that. But I, I think there needs to be a, a more intentional focus in the curriculum um, and uh, just really from start to finish. So even thinking when uh, when you're pregnant, what are some what's the education you're getting a, around you know health uh health benefit or you know just ways to be healthier and um are you then supported throughout uh you know your when your child's born and the the rest of the process because i i think of even myself um i'm i try to be healthy but a lot of that stuff wasn't ingrained in me as a child and it makes it a little harder um I think also making sure that we have access to healthy options, um, be that fresh food, be that green space, trees, et cetera. Um, I mean, that's on us as the city to help support. But, um, you know, if you don't have some of those things, it just as an individual, it makes it really hard for you to, um, you know, be healthier when you sometimes don't know where to start. I'll turn it over to Alberto to help hopefully <laughs> – this is Elaborate a tough more. One. Yeah, this is a tough one for me, to be quite honest. Um, so I, I, I'm going to start with, you know, like asset based approach or strength based approach. Uh, you know, at least my experience here in Seattle is that many of like, let's say, our uh, BIPOC communities, immigrant communities, refugee communities are doing the sustained. This is the way in which we do life. Right. And in our countries, you know, like composting is not an option right it's like well, this is what you do to to kind of like have your a healthy garden to have beautiful plants and things like that so how how do you incentivize that you know and, and begin from celebrating those uh, things that we are already doing and trying to scale them I, I don't have solutions for that there but you know I think you know acid-based strength-based approach uh, are better than like the don't do this or kind of like uh, sometimes like the rule rules where, you know I have issues with authority so I don't like people telling me kind of like what to do or what not to do um, I do know that um, some of my colleagues I cannot speak to this very well to be honest but are being more intentional especially with the food security the food policy and and chop and, and team are working more closely with our uh, Seattle public schools on kind of like uh, uh, water fountains water reusable water bottles and things like that uh, but I really this is a new thing and I I, I don't I, I'll be happy to connect you with some of those uh, those people um, and then I had another thought, but I think I'm losing my train of thought because this is not my 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 strength, uh, to be quite honest. So I'll, I'll come back to that if I remember where I was going with this. Um, I think one thing I'll add, Alberto, that you um, brought to mind for me is um, I think we also I, I'm finding we need to be very respectful of folks circumstances as well. Um, so for you know thinking sustainability we want folks to not we want them to drive cars less but if you've been in a position where you have not been able to afford a car for your entire life and then you finally reach the point where you can um I don't want to be the person that's like, no, you're now you're doing something wrong because you're driving, um, you know, and, and I think it's for us trying to find that balance of and in some folks circumstances, they've been practicing a circular economy and recycling for as long as they've lived because they just it's out of necessity and survival. Um, so I think we're we're trying to also maybe just reconcile, um, you know, how how we make people feel in what we're asking them to do. And um, again, just meeting folks where they are. So that just, that came to mind and I wanted to, to throw that out there. Thank you, Kristen. I think one of the themes that has come up today and comes up when we talk about these issues is that it, it is complex. It's so difficult to know 
what the first step needs to be um, and how to balance things like you mentioned, you know, you want to bring people along, you don't want to alienate them, but there's also the, the issue of timing, you know, do you, do you take action quickly knowing how important this is, or do you take small steps so that you don't push people away from the effort? Um, and it seems like every city sort of takes a slightly different approach, all moving towards these same ultimate goals. My final question for you might be an unfair one, so I apologize in advance, but one of the themes that I always hear is you have to get community buy-in in order to motivate change at the city level. But to do so, you have to be able to convey the issues to people in power, not just in government power, but business people, et cetera, so that they understand. And so the question I have for you is how do you convince people or explain the issues to people in a way that gets them motivated to be a part of the solution. So how do you get citizens in, I think it was Lynnhurst to care about the, the struggles of people in South Park? How do, you, how do you go about that? Alberto, do you wanna start us off? Yes, uh, so, so, uh, so far, uh, you know, it's like the way in which we've approached the work uh, is, you know, that we co-develop let's say inclusive community engagement plans with community members, right? So when I want to prioritize the voices of the Vietnamese community, then I used to bring Peter Quinn Gwen, right? And I would sit down with Peter and develop, you know, what is the right strategy to talk? How do we talk about this? You know, when I want to cater, you know, or approach the Latinx community, you know, bring Paulina Lopez, you know, bring a, a bunch of uh, Luis Amado and co-develop those plans. And then I would fund them to actually work with the neighbors, you know, work with their peers to actually spread the word, organize, let's say, like, for, for example, this is a, a one a very specific example that I, 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 I can share. You know, uh, there was uh, maybe like three or four years ago, 2017, maybe we wanted to hear from the Vietnamese community, right? We were prioritizing the voices of Latinx, Vietnamese, Somali communities in, in South Park. And I talked to Peter and I was like, hey, Peter, what's up? You know, how do we talk about these issues, you know, and, and we get input from the Vietnamese community. He's like, let's host a, a karaoke night. And we're like, and I'm like, what? And then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go with this. Uh, so we hosted a, a karaoke, actually an intergenerational dinner with Vietnamese seniors and a local youth program. And then we gather input, you know, he kind of like uh, co-developed this strategy. And then we hosted a karaoke night, right? And a bunch of people showed up, right? A bunch of people were engaged and we were in relationship. You know, I was not necessarily the city guy, but I was the guy that was, trying to sing karaoke i'm not a very good singer with you know the community so so it would uh that's the way that we've approached right in which we really and i mean it we co-develop and co-implement all inclusive prioritization exercises with the people from the community and uh then when i have when peter and i are standing next to each other you know i'm not this random guy anymore i am Peter, this Vietnamese senior, this leader, you know, from the community, you know, that it's vouching, you know, informally for me. So that gives me some street cred to a certain, you know, uh, to a certain degree. And that is how we've approached our work, you know, especially as we prioritize BIPOC and low income voices in our work. But so again, co-creating, co-developing, co-implementing, you know, strategies on how to spread the word, prioritize, and how to implement work uh, has been what has worked for us in Seattle. Thank you, Alberto. Kristen? Um, so uh, a couple things come to mind. Um, the, the big one, you know, right when you had asked the question that, that popped into my head was a quote I heard maybe about two years ago. Um, if you bring me in early, I'm your partner. If you bring me in late, I'm your judge. And I think, you know, especially as we've updated our climate action plan, that, that phrase has really resonated with me because um, I've seen m many times throughout my, my career here in the city um, ideas that we bring to the community that we think are going to be there, the cat's pajamas, and they're going to solve all of your problems. Um, when the community gets it, they, it is not received in the, the way that we want. And, you know, that really, for me, has 
told me that we need to talk to them first and foremost. So before I go into any meeting, community or otherwise, I try to just do some background research. I try to see what maybe an organization is already doing, um, maybe some of their projects, et cetera, so that I can right off the bat talk about how our work aligns with their work. And there's, there's value in us partnering rather than um, me saying, hey, this is what I need you to do. Go tell me how you're going to do it. Um, if I can more say, hey, where are you at? This is where we're at. Maybe we can meet together. Um, I find it uh, leads to just better conversations, better collaboration. And um, even in some cases, those folks uh, come to me later and say, hey, I have this opportunity. Could the Office of Sustainability help me? And those are our new champions that are helping to, to drive some of this work forward. Um, and then really, I mean, for me, it's, in anybody that I'm working with, I try to just be be myself and be real and use simple, easy language as much as I can. Because um, we, we kind of jokingly say in our office, if uh, you're if you can get across your message to uh, a fifth grader, then really anybody in our community is going to be able to uh, to understand it. And th that may be oversimplifying, but uh, recognizing that not everybody eats, sleeps, and breathes sustainability the way that I do. Um, you know, if you can just talk to them like a normal person, get them to understand that, you know, we're, we're all in this together, and, um, and I recognize that you have your challenges. Here's some of mine. How do we, how do we figure it out? Um, that's where I think we've seen the most success in, in implementing sustainability, climate action, and equity work. Great Thank question. You. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Alberto. I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Standifer. This was a great panel. I am so excited that uh, we have started to talk, talk the talk, walk the walk, and we have those who have laid out plans and are actually implementing what we are talking about, especially what Hillary talked about and what Fair, uh, Fair Fight Action is doing. And I, I, I'm so elated that to have all of you on the panel, uh, most importantly, in talking about civic engagement and the responsibility of those who are fighting for environmental justice, climate justice, and a change in what's happening, especially with in the space of health equity. So on behalf of Daniel Dawes, SHLI and Morehouse School of Medicine, we'd like to thank Alberto Rodriguez uh, from Seattle, Kristen Hall from City of Cleveland, I'm a, form, I'm a Buckeye, so it's great to have you there. Again, uh, Sarah Houston for being a great moderator, all the attendees uh, this morning, and we thank you so much. And please uh, be, uh, be aware and tune in for the upcoming sessions. We have the next session planned for February 23rd where we will be speaking on discontinuing the dialogue as we talked about the tool for it all is language, it's communication, right? It's being yourself. And we're talking about informing and applying and uh, advocating again uh, and educating on community advocacy and mobilizing for environmental health equity, right? And so this is something that we wanna continue on and hopefully we're going to get uh, additional future uh, Congress persons to be on, uh, again, uh, representatives from BIPOC communities to really talk about some of the strategies that are being implemented in their respective jurisdictions. Uh, also, I believe that it was posted for the survey. Any feedback that you may have, any additional comments or questions, please feel free to add them and post them in the survey that uh, we will send you after. And we also are asking to take some time to look in the chat and complete the survey. We thank you all and looking forward to continuing the fair fight and the good trouble. Thank you both. Take care. Thank you all. Have a good rest of uh, your week, and hopefully we'll get to work with you again soon. Great uh, presenting with you, Alberto. Thank you. Likewise, Kristen. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. You had wonderful closing comments. Thank you. Yes. Uh, if there's any questions or anything after, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you, guys.